that letter may have been addressed to us, but it's Suggested directed to, to you. You know, we, we didn't do that. We did that, yeah. all of us. And, and every time we allow our heart to be touched by the needs of someone else, we're just flowing in what Jesus called us to do in the first place just to be sensitive to the needs of others and, and to respond. And <coughs> um, this coming Saturday, we meet at 9 a.m. for prayer, just an hour to come together. And Sunday is family fellowship. So please, um, if, if you're going to be preparing something or bringing something, please get in touch with Michelle and let her know um, so that we you know, don't just have dessert next Sunday, but we have a meal as well. I know life is short and we want to eat dessert first, but we really should keep things in order, all right? Well, last week we spoke about the great commandment and loving God with your whole mind. Remember, um, I was blessed this week. I got responses to that message. I got a heart from Florida, and I got a beautiful text from Georgia. Anybody in Holbrook affected? <laughs> um, it is tough. It is tough to try and wrap your mind around God. But the heart is easy. We give God our heart. We trust him with our heart um, as much as we're able. But our mind is the last, the last thing we surrender. But th this morning, I, I, I guess I want to go in a, a, a bit of a, a different direction. But first, let me ask you, did, did that message provoke you at all to rethink how you think about God, how you see God in your mind? Um, did it open anything up for anybody? Did it, did it change anything? I got a nod from Joe. Okay, that's, that's progress, my brother. But really, we have to think about what we think about. We can't just respond. We can't just be kind of robotic, like that little thing that goes around and, and vacuums your floor and bumps into a chair and goes the other way. And then, you know, we, we, we get like that. You know, we just until we, we keep going until we bump into something, then we turn a little bit and go another way. You know, um, God gave us a mind, and we really, really need to use it. But, but this morning, this morning, whatever are we going to talk about? Well, welcome to Let's Make a Deal. I found in my, uh, in my Bible a crisp almost brand new $10 bill. And, and I, and I want to see if I can swap it. I want to see if I can entice anybody to think about exchanging this. Would anybody give me $50 for this? Don't all answer at once. No, okay. Um, let's, let's sweeten it. How about 45 Somebody give me $45 for this $10 bill. No, I don't want your money, Rich. Were well, you going to swap 10s with me? A 5 A, f a 50 You carry that kind of money? You are blessed, but thank you. But I'm making a point, but I did not expect a positive response. There's a man who puts his faith into action. He knew there had to be a blessing in that, otherwise he would have just held on to the 50. Well, kind of stole my thunder, Rich. <laughs> I guess 40 wouldn't work, 30, 20. I guess the best I could do is have somebody swap 10s with me. That would be it. Two fives? Two fives, yes. 
Um, they don't have it, twice it's, they don't have twice as many bills. This, is, this offer definitely will not be repeated. Um, <laughs> this, it was an illustration, and it's going to lead us somewhere. But today, today I want to talk about knowing God and see how well we know God. Um, how many think they have a pretty good handle on knowing God? Come on, we know him. We know him. How do you know him? Do you talk to him? Yeah. Does he talk back? Yeah, he does. So all of us, to some degree, know God. Correct? Is that a safe assumption? Yeah. We know the Lord. And we know God based on our own individual experiences and some of the things we've heard about from others. But I've heard, and I've often repeated, if God doesn't deal with America, he's going to have to raise up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize. Anybody ever heard that? Anybody agree with it? I have one. Leonard Ravenhill said that. It doesn't matter who said it. It doesn't matter who said it. It's been beaten to death, and I don't know why I'm getting a, a reverb. But how many would agree with that statement? I did, but I don't. And I know, I know he was a great author and, and a great theologian and, and a man who was close to the Lord. But, but the God that I know, um, doesn't, doesn't have to apologize. I did look through scriptures, and thank heaven it's, it's early on, but I found a place where God did apologize. In the book of Genesis, chapter 6, and verse 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. Not sometimes, not once in a while, continually. We just got worse and worse and worse. And the Lord was sorry. I would think that's an apology. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. It's the only time God ever apologized. But what happened? A man by the name of Noah, in verse 8, found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God is ready to wipe out all mankind. He's so disappointed, disheartened, grieved, upset. But one man found favor with God. And through his obedience... You and I are here today because we could have been wiped out. But God had favor with one man. Um, it's amazing that God would ever, you know, if he wants to apologize, he can. But, but to record it and admit it shows you the kind of God we love and serve. But because of Noah's favor and obedience, we're alive today. Let's fast forward. Let's go to Genesis chapter 18. And I want to look at the first two verses. God is um, visiting Abraham. And we find that the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the tent door in the heat of the day. And when he lifted up his eyes and looked, behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth. Now, it wasn't that he never got company. It's that he knew he was in the presence of the Lord. Abraham, a man who also found favor with God. But I, I, I want to kind of highlight the difference between Noah and Abraham. Um, both are mentioned in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. But Noah, because of the favor of God and his obedience, constructed an ark 
and his family and creation were preserved. But he just went about whatever God said was good enough for him. Some of us, some of us are content to live like Noah. I just, whatever God says, that's it, I'll do it, you know. But what's different about Abraham? Abraham, he, he, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't a friend of God at the outset. He became a friend of God because he listened to the Lord and he walked with the Lord and God visited him and he obeyed the Lord, but he took it another step. Um, I'm, on the wrong, I'm on the right page. Um, in verse 16, let me just flip over here. Then the men, I, I did that by way of introduction. Then the men rose up from there and looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham was walking with them to send them off. He had this visit, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Does God reveal through his servants? Does he reveal what his plans are? What he intends? Does he just drop it on anybody? Does he just, you know, hover over Times Square and when the light changes and people stop, he just gives somebody an indication? Who does God talk to? He talks to the people who talk to him. Who, who, do, who does God interact with? Those who interact with him. And God... God really wrestles with this, and, 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 and he says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? I mean, here he is. Abraham is very successful. He's been blessed by God. He, he has, uh, has plenty. In fact, he had so much that he had to separate from his nephew Lot because the tribesmen were fighting because there wasn't enough land to graze for all of the cattle and all the sheep and, and all the herds, everything they had. God had blessed them and multiplied um, their, their belongings. And they had to separate. But Abraham stayed close to God. He listened to God. He obeyed God. And, and, it, um, and God, God explains why. He says, since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Are we blessed? Are we a blessed people? Because of Abraham, because of his obedience and his walk with the Lord, all the nations. There was a time when it was just the Jewish people were getting blessed. But now everybody, everybody from, from wherever is blessed because of Abraham's obedience. He continues, for I've chosen him so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. God, God intends to fulfill his promises. God intends to release blessings. But we've got to be walking with them to enjoy them or they'll happen to us and we won't even recognize them. Before I came to the Lord, I thought I was so clever and things happened because I was in the right place at the right time, or, or um, uh, Lady Luck was with me, or whatever. God was blessing me before I even knew there was a God who blessed. But that's, that's the way he is. And he continues, and the Lord said, the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is exceedingly grave. They're a lousy people. No limits, no boundaries. They did whatever they felt like doing to whoever they wanted to do it to, and what are you going to do about it? I will go down now and see if they have done entirely according to its outcry, which has come to me, and if not, I will know. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omnipotent all-powerful, and he's omniscient. He knows everything. You and I, we may have gotten away with something, but God knows about it. 
He knows about it. And if, you're, if it's troubling you, tell him. Once it's out in the open, nobody, nobody can bother you with it. And your relationship with the Lord is healed because God knows. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom while Abraham was still standing before the Lord. So those two guys left. What, what, what would you presume they were? Were they just guys that God picked up, you know, at, at, at the 7-Eleven? He said, you two, come with me. They were day laborers. Who do you think these two guys were? Angels. Can you name any angels? Gabriel? Michael? Who? I don't know that one. It's only only two angels whose names I know. Three. Three. I'm sorry? Raphael is mentioned in the Apocryphal books. Oh, that's in the Apocryphal books. Not, it's not in our text, not in our course. <laughs> but I, I thank you. There's one more. That's the one. Lucifer. We don't, we, don't, we don't spend much time with him. Okay, those are the only three angels named in, 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 the, in, in the Old and, and, and New Testaments. So um, anyway, these guys head down to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham was still standing before the Lord. And Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? That's a fair question to ask God. You know, yeah, that's a bad place. You don't want to go there. It's lousy. But, but what if? Are, are, are you just going to wipe it out because of the report? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly. Let me, I have a little note here. I want to go to Ezekiel 33, and I just want to read you two verses. Verse 10 and 11 of Ezekiel 33 say, Now as for you, son of man, Say to the house of Israel, thus you have spoken, saying, Surely our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How then can we survive? <clears throat> Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. Why then will you die, O house of Israel? God is long-suffering. God's desire. He knows we're not going to get it right. But if we will turn to him, if we will repent, there's yet hope. There's salvation. There's comfort. God it takes no pleasure. He's not, as I was taught early on, he's not sitting in heaven with me, with a circle around me, waiting, if I step out the circle, he's going to hit me with a bolt of lightning. That's not the heart of God. That's not the person of God. If that's the God you know, somebody taught you incorrectly. That's wrong. God is love. Love. Love doesn't keep score. Love doesn't retaliate. But love draws. Love pulls us closer to him. All right, I, I just wanted to, to give you that little in, insight from there. So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. That's why, you know, I was trying to get 50 for 10. And Abraham replied, Now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the fifty righteous are lacking five. 
Oh, what's 50 minus 5? 45. God says, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. He continues in verse 29. Suppose 40 are found. He said, I will not do it on account of the 40. And Abraham continues. You see the difference between Noah and Abraham? Noah obediently did what God asked him to do, but he, he, he didn't discuss it with him. He didn't, he didn't challenge God at all, saying, can't you be merciful here? Can't you give us a little more time? Can't you do this, that, the other thing, whatever? No, Noah was just obedient. Nothing wrong with that. But Abraham took it a step further, and he, tried, and he began to negotiate with Almighty God. He said, I will not do it on account of the 40. He continues, God says, I will not do it if I find 30. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 20. And then Abraham says, oh, may the Lord not be angry. And I shall speak only this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. If he could just find 10 righteous in that city. What about in this city? Are there 10 righteous? Are there 10 who seek after God? In this nation, there are, I'm sure, tens of thousands of people who love and fear and appreciate Almighty God. Is he going to destroy America because the majority don't give a hoot about him? Or is he going to honor those who do walk uprightly before him? And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the ten. And as soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed, and Abraham returned to his place. You think Abraham did better than Noah? By negotiating with God? By having a relationship where he could speak to the Lord? Sure, he made progress. Do you think Abraham took it as far as he could? Yeah. I don't think so. I think he could have pressed him. The reason I say that is because in Jeremiah 5, Jeremiah was a bullfrog. Jeremiah, where are you? Jeremiah. Ed, can you find Jeremiah? All right, 5-1. As soon he, God is speaking, and he says to, the, to, uh, to Jeremiah the prophet, roam to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and look now and take note, and seek in her open squares, if you can find a man, if there is one who does justice, who seeks truth, then I will pardon her. God talking about Jerusalem, and, and how, they, how far they had strayed from Almighty God. There it only was going to take one. If Abraham had continued, perhaps Sodom and Gomorrah would, would be around today. But God does what he does for whatever reason he does. Is it a lesson for us? It sure is. Why Abraham stopped at 10, I don't know. One day, I might have the opportunity to ask him. I don't know. But here, God's heart is revealed where he says, if I find just one, just one. Does that, does that expose the heart of God to you? Does that tell you something that he takes no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked? What does God want? He wants all to come to repentance, all to turn from their wickedness and their ways. That's the heart of the God we serve and love and, and are, are hoping to know or, or are striving to know. And each time you encounter God, you get to know him a little bit better, a little more. You get more of a glimpse, more of a facet. God is like a diamond. You, you know, uh, you could only look at a little bit of it at a time, at a little bit of him. You can't. You can't comprehend him. If we could understand God, we'd be him. 
but there's so much more to know about him. And in knowing him and being with him and listening to him, to hear his voice. Um, um, let's look at Exodus. I, I, I have somebody else in mind I, I want to share with you. Um, Exodus 34 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. Moses, by the way, was the first one to break all the Ten Commandments. So he cut a verse four. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning, went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Can you imagine God's frustration? He, he writes with his hand on two tablets the whole law of God for the, for the children of Israel. And Moses gets so upset with the way they behave, he just smashes them. Now he's got to go back and do this again. But as he describes the Lord, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate. Do you know anybody more compassionate than the Lord? And gracious, slow to anger. Who's more long-suffering, you or God? God is. Slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Can you find Micah 7 and verse 18? The prophet Micah tells us something about the Lord. Who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in unchanging love. If God is love, and he's the personification of love, and, and, and everything about God is love, then love doesn't change because it doesn't have to because it's complete in him. And we experience that love in so many different ways. And yet we can't exhaust his love. How many have had their love exhausted? That's it. I'm done with you. You're out. You know, we, our love has limits. After a while, you feel like you're really being raked over the coals. No, no more chances. 35 is enough. You keep messing up. I'm, I'm done. But God is never done. Never done. Loves us. Loves us um, in that way. Now, the same passage, if I stop there, I, I, I'd be cheating you. Because it continues. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Is that scary? Any, anybody here ever guilty of iniquity? Oh, but we have such lovely grandchildren. That's because we've come out of it. That's for those who are so hell-bent on their own destruction that they will not consider God, they will not turn, they will not repent. That's the curse. The blessing is that God forgives and God loves and God restores and God puts back together, you know, what all the king's men and all the king's horses couldn't do. God can do. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth in worship. And, and he says, oh, oh, 
If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your own possession. He pleads for the people, as Abraham pleaded for Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant before all your people, I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations, and all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord. Wherever you go, people are going to know that God is your God, and the God of Israel, the God of the, the, the children of Israel, the, the, the people of the book that their God is with them and he does um, great and awesome things. He says, and all the people among you will, will see the working of the Lord for it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. Not for you, not because of you, with you. God wants to perform those awesome, awesome things. Um, uh, he, you know, Daniel tells us, um, as he's speaking of the last times, I, I, think it's, I think it's chapter 31, where Daniel says, and the people who know their God shall do mighty exploits. What is it? 1132. I knew there was a 30 in there. Okay. Um, but Daniel says, in speaking of the end times, that God's people will do mighty exploits. The people of the Lord. Isn't that you and me? Isn't that us? Aren't we God's people? Haven't we given ourselves to him? Doesn't Christ live in us? Aren't we spirit-filled folk? So where's the exploits? God wants to work through us. We've got to yield to him. We've got to give him the opportunity. That's what he wants to do. Um, so Moses intercedes for the children of Israel, and God promises to perform mighty exploits with them. Well, Abraham and Moses are gone. So who's left to intercede for us? Well, let's look at Romans 8, see if that tells us something. Romans 8, I'll pick it up in verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Is God for you? Yeah, he's for you and me. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Abraham stopped short. Moses took it a little further. But we have Jesus. We have Jesus who also intercedes for us. And, and just one more reference. In Hebrews chapter 7. Two verses. Verse 24 says, But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Who's interceding for you and I right now? Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father, but how does he intercede? Is it just because he's God and he knows everything? The things we give him, he brings to the Father. The things we give the Father in Jesus' name get stored up. 
God hears every cry and every prayer, but he answers them at his own discretion. We have a high priest, Jesus, constantly making intercession for us, but we've got to bring those things to him. And for that reason, for that reason, um, it, it doesn't end there. It really doesn't. Does it? Does it stop there? Okay, Jesus, do what you do best. You know, keep opening the doors. Keep, keep, you know, keep things smooth. No waves. You know, um, no speed bumps. Let's, let's just glide along till you return. No. Who are you willing to intercede for? Sometimes. We have to cry out on our own behalf. There's a self-preservation instinct. Sometimes there's a real issue that we're dealing with, and we need to go before the Lord and present it. But more often than not, it's the needs of others that we need to bring to the throne of grace that we need to present. But we need to be interacting. You're never going to know God if you're not spending any time with him. You're never going to know God if you don't know him through this book. You're never going to know God if you haven't brought him a prayer and watch it be answered. You're not going to know him. You'll know about him, but you won't know him. It'll never be a personal relationship. Listen, we know a whole lot of things about a whole lot of people that are in the limelight but we never met him. It's not how many facts you have. It's how have you interacted. Who are you willing to intercede for? Let's see this Saturday at 9 a.m. One hour, God asks us to come together. One hour. Will you not watch with me one hour? Let's stand. Father, there is so much that we don't know about you. So much that we don't know about us and what you require of us. But Lord, you have called the people together and you have given us all we need to know and it's up to us to begin to um, go through it and see what's appropriate for us in this season. What, what do you need from us right now? What are you requiring of us? And what do you have for us that we have not apprehended? What do you want to bless us with that we've missed, that we've failed to? Um, the blessing comes in so many forms, so many forms. The blessing can be just the satisfaction of having asked God to help somebody and, they, and, and, and he does it, and, and they come back and say, thank you for praying, because here's how God worked it out. D does, does that inspire you, encourage you to want to do it again, to want to get a couple of more people on your prayer list, to get most more folks closer to the Lord? Of course it does. Take somebody's hand, because I just want to speak a blessing over you this morning. Um, last month was Father's Day, but, but every day, is Father's Day for the child of God. And I just want to speak of Father's blessing. Lord, we have come. We have um, examined your word. We have seen, Lord, we have the examples of Abraham and Moses. Lord, we have uh, what you said through the prophets. We have the recorded word. Lord, Holy Spirit, would you tuck that away in our spirit? Would you seal it? so that we wouldn't be forgetful hearers, and would you bless your people today. Bless them, knowing that their mind is being expanded as they come to know you, as they desire to know you more. And Lord, that they are a people who want to know you better, not just love you with their heart, soul, and, and mind, but to, to, to know you to interact with you, to grow stronger, and to know, Lord, even as Daniel said, that the people who know their God will do mighty exploits. Lord, I pray you would release your people from this moment forward 
to go and declare the God that they know, the God that they love, and the God who is seeking to help those who don't know him. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. God bless you.